Whiteboard. Yes. yes, I can see it. Dan. Yep. Okay, so Apple today is uh, 147. So Apple the stock is 147. If I were bullish on Apple, I would buy a call. And if I was bearish on Apple, I would buy a put. But to be honest with you, I'm not sure whether Apple is going up or down. So, you know, if I was going to buy a call on Apple, I'd be buying upward volatility. I would be saying Apple is going to go up. It's going to go up at least by uh, the amount of my premium. You know, it's going to be strike price plus premium. And I'd say it's going to take place between now and expiration. And if I bought a put, I'd be buying downward volatility. I'd be saying Apple's going to go down. It's going to go down by the amount of at least my premium to cover my out-of-pocket cost, break even, and I'm bearish. So if I'm doing a straddle, what I'm straddling is the strike price line. So, you know, straddle is when I'm long two different type of options or short two different type of option contracts. The option contracts, remember, are calls and puts. So I'm going to buy one Apple July 145 call at six. And I'm going to buy one Apple July 145 put at six. So test question number one is, can you identify the multiple option strategy? So the first thing you'll be able to do on the test is identify a straddle. If you can't identify it, you don't know what to do next. So even if that wasn't a test question, I just told you it is. Even if it wasn't, if you can't do that, you don't know what to do next. Long two different type of option contracts or short two different type of option contracts because we have long straddles and we have short straddles. The two types of contracts are calls and puts. So any uh, problem identifying that as a straddle? That's test question number one is, can you identify a straddle? The second test question about a straddle is, can you calculate the break-evens? Can you calculate the break-evens? This is the only one on the Series 7 that you have two break-evens. You have what's called an upside break-even and a downside break-even. Now, as we said, uh, there's two great memory aid devices, call up and put down, call up and put down. And by the way, if you're on the SIE or 65, this isn't testable for you. So this is, you know, a series seven only. Anyways, call up, strike price plus total premium is going to give me my upside break even. And strike price minus total premium is going to give me my downside break even. So in this example, uh, we're going to total up our premiums. And when we total up our premiums, We have 12. It's, it doesn't matter, by the way, if that's 12 out or 12 in. You know, if when you have buy, buy, you add or sell, sell, and it's the same thing, that's what you do here. But that's 12 points that we're out of pocket for this position. Now, if I really wanted to teach you options, I'd make you buy one. And once you were out of pocket, you'd figure out pretty quickly how this game works. All right, so I'm out of pocket, 12 points. And let's see, my break even, as we said, is going to be our strike price. By the way, that's what we're straddling is the strike price. We're straddling 145. So it's going to be 145 plus 12. And uh, Brian was making fun of me on the live stream today, but I use my pre my calculator because I don't want to give up, you know, questions because I can't do arithmetic. So 145 plus 12 
and I get my upside break even at 157. And then I'm going to take my 145. I got to cover my out of pocket cost. So I need to go up or down 12 points to cover my out of pocket cost. And again, I'm going to use my calculator. 145 minus 12 is 133. That's my downside break even. You know, if you were thinking about uh, some people are visual people, here is the price of Apple. As I said, we're straddling the strike price line. And the strike price is 145. And we said we're going to have our upside break even. And we're going to have our downside break even. And so our upside break even is 157. And our downside break even is 133. Yeah, third test question. The third test question is where is the straddle profitable? Where is the straddle profitable? Where do we need the market price of Apple to be to make some money? Because nobody does things to break even. We're trying to make some money. Where is the straddle profitable? Now we have a great memory aid device here and it's silo. And that stands for short inside long outside. If it's a short straddle, we want the market price to be in between these two numbers. And if it's long, we want it outside these two numbers. So silo is a great mnemonic device to remind us where we want straddles to be in relationship to the current market price. If we're short the straddle, we want the market price to be in between, short inside, long outside. And so this is a long straddle. So test question, where do we want Apple to be in relationship to our break evens? We want Apple to be above 157 or below 133. And that's where it's profitable. It's going to be in unprofitable in between 140, uh, 133 and 157. You know, the worst closing price at expiration uh, would be uh, 145. Now the short straddle would be the opposite. This is a long straddle. We're doing a short straddle. We will want Apple to be in between there. Short inside, long outside. So if I just change the buy buy to sell sell, it would be the same break even. It's just a matter where you want it. So silo is a good way to remember that. And then the fourth test question about a straddle is when do you use a straddle? When do you deploy uh, this strategy? And you buy a straddle when you're expecting volatility, but direction is uncertain. So when do you use a straddle? And you buy a straddle, buy a straddle when direction's uncertain. I just saw one today, I was gonna, you know, I was gonna make up a practice question for you. Uh, this is a, a good straddle setup. You know, this is one that speaks to me. This company is in trouble this morning, I was reading, and. They've hired a new CEO and he's either going to fix their problems or he's not. They didn't quite say that. I mean, they, you know, the board hired him because they think he can fix the problems. But I'm thinking, well, maybe he can. What do I care if he fixes the problems or he doesn't fix the problems? I don't think the stock is going to stay within the trading range, right? So I'm buying non-directional volatility. I buy a straddle when I expect volatility, but direction's uncertain. So as long as you know, this guy does either he fix it and the stock goes up and my call comes through or he doesn't fix it, my put comes through. I expect volatility, the direction is uncertain. And then uh, you actually sell a straddle when you expect a trading range, right? That's pretty seductive. I say, do you think Apple is going to stay between 133 and 157? If so, there's a way to profit from the stock staying within the trading range or being neutral. So you sell a straddle when you expect a trading range. Uh, chat is open. Can you see a problem with a short straddle? 
or not. You're selling the volatility is what I'm going to get. Anybody see a problem with that short straddle? Sure, Cynthia, we can certainly walk through that. Uh, anybody see a problem with short straddle? I would definitely know short straddles have unlimited risk. Short straddles have unlimited risk, right? This is a long straddle, but you know, a short straddle, if I just change this, And now it's a short strap. We wouldn't do anything different, by the way. We wouldn't do anything different. You tell me it's a short straddle, I could say sell, short, right, whatever. Uh, we calculate the break evens, we determine where it's profitable, short inside, long outside. This is neutral, Jacob, because I make money if Apple stays at 147. Right now, Apple's 147. And so right now, this short straddle would be uh, profitable. So neutral means I, the stock doesn't move and I make money. Uh, I think was that you, somebody went to talk with options with stock, Jacqueline. So, you know, covered call could be a neutral strategy, right? Because if I do a covered call, which I'm gonna show you, I make money even if the stock doesn't move. So that's what neutral means. So long straddles are not neutral, short straddles could be neutral. Okay, any other questions on the straddle? Pretty straightforward on the test. You gotta be able to tell me it's a straddle. Uh, I would just add, there are straddles with different strike prices called combinations. A straddle with different strike prices is called a combination. You wouldn't do anything differently. So in other words, if I just change this, and now it's a 140 put, we wouldn't do anything differently. Uh, we would just combine the premiums, add it to the call, we subtract it from the put. So now it's gonna be 140 minus 12, and that's called a combination. So the same four things, it's just called a combination. Okay, so let's do our next one. Our next one is uh, options led by the stock. I like that you said led by the stock because that's the key. The stock dominates. So if we uh, buy 100 shares of Apple uh, today at uh, 144 or 147, that's what Apple's at today. It doesn't matter what we do next. The stock dominates. So I'm about to add an option position to this. And it doesn't matter what option position I add to this. The stock always dominates. That means without it doing anything, you should be able to tell me that this is a bullish position. So as a test taker, the minute you see the shares, you got to say, oh, this is stock and stock dominates. This is a bullish position. Your point, it's led by the stock. And you know the other thing to kind of get down is if I bought the stock, which I've done here, and I'm make a T. I like to use a T to track money in and out. If you can track money in and out, if you can track money in and out, and you are not fumbling around with contract specifications, you will get a hundred on options because there'd be no way to fool you. I mean, you can memorize things. That's fine. But you know, the more things you memorize, the, you know, that's going to continue to compound on you. And then I like to, on my other side, say, okay, this is going to be dollars in. And some people like to think that as a credit. Some people like to think of that as a plus sign, you know, whatever floats your boat. Again, I did warn you, be a little careful that you don't have too many people, you know, in your head because you got to figure out what you're going to do. What is going to be your method? Uh, for solving, you know, option questions. I would tell you, I've helped thousands of people over many years pass their exam. So if you're not going to do it Dean's way, then, you know, just, I'm just warning you that I had a young lady, I mean, we'll talk about willful. I mean, you got to admire her willfulness, but she said she had her own way to do options, her own method. I go, really? And, you know, I said, well, it's not working because you keep getting these questions wrong. So, you know, if as long as your method is working, you're getting the right answer, then fine. But, you know, if not, you might want to reconsider that. Now, the reason I want to show you the T is because you're interested in being able to do the offset. So what I mean by that is I bought the Apple at 147. I've done an opening purchase here. And so what I want to be able to do is offset. And what I mean by offset is by this, I can get a 50-50 because I know that I want to be able to sell the stock. 
that I bought, right? So that means I'm going to have two option positions that are going to work here. I'm either going to go short a call for income and create an obligation to sell the stock that I own, or I'm going to go long a put for protection. You know, I can buy some insurance. Insurance costs money on the stock. So th that's what's going to happen next. Now, it's more often than not, you're going to get a covered call. It's more often than not, you're going to get a covered call. So I'm going to show you a buy right or a covered call, test question suitability. I'm about to generate additional income on my stock position. I'm about to generate additional income on my stock position. You know, this is a pretty, listen, as option strategy go, this is a pretty damn good one. I say, Jacqueline, how would you like to get paid hundreds of dollars in advance to agree to sell high stock you just bought low? If you'll agree to sell the Apple stock at 155 that you bought at 147 somebody will give you a lot of money. So let's do a buy right a buy right. So we're going to do a buy right or a covered call. Now be careful. We can only uh, write as many contracts. Remember, write means short. I could say write or show, you know, whatever. I can only write one contract, right? Because I only have hundred shares. There's no such thing as being partially naked. So, you know, just don't be looking for a trick, but you know, if I write two contracts, I'm going to have unlimited risk. Now, Jacqueline, we got to decide how long do we want to be obligated to sell the stock? You know, longer term option contracts will give us a greater premium, right? So the longer we go out, the more money we'll get. So, you know, I could write a leap, for example, and get some huge, huge money. Let's say we go out to uh, December. This is really important. We're about to put in a ceiling. And one of the downsides, Jacqueline, of this strategy is you don't participate past the strike. You don't participate past the strike. So the more bullish we are, the higher the strike we should write. The less bullish, the lower the strike we should write. You know, lower strike calls, contracts, Jacqueline, always have a greater premium. So we'll get more money for selling the 150s than we're going to get for the 155s. You know, so we're going to sell the uh, 155 call contract. And let's say we get uh, eight for that. Now, what I like to do, again, what Dean likes to do is not testable. But what I would like to do, I, certainly, Jacob, we have time. It's a 45-minute overtime Zoom session. It's not a class. We did a whole two-hour class on this. This is an overtime Zoom. So I'll get to as much as I can in the 45 minutes. And then if you, Jacob, if you join us for the next time, you can put it in the queue. And if I don't get it, I'll get to it then. Or if you're a paid student, uh, if you're an alumni, you can sign up for an office hour. That's free, and I think there's one more spot left on the office hour. Uh, let's see, okay, so one thing I like to do, and this is just what I would recommend to you, is I like underneath the option contract, say, what am I looking at? And so what this is, is an obligation to sell the stock at the strike price. And as I told you, that is uh, something we need to recognize is that we're not gonna participate uh, past that 155. And that 155 did generate additional income. So we're going to put that over here. And that's money we brought in. And we brought in eight points by agreeing to sell high stock we bought low. So that's kind of bueno. Right, we're bringing eight points. Now, the other thing I would recommend to you is I personally don't like to put $14,700. And I don't like to put $800 in there. I like to do things on a per share basis because that's how the test is. And then I can just multiply once. What I mean by how the test is, break even is expressed as a per share number. So the other reason I like uh, my method is if you don't want to memorize a bunch of stuff, you know that the break even is going to be a number that if we plug it in there would make the columns balance because that's what break even is. Same dollars out as dollars in. So you can either memorize that when you have a covered call, the break even is the stock cost less the premium. This is the one time and the one time only you have a call contract and you are actually subtracting because this is not an option position. This is not an option position. This is a stock position. So we paid 147 for the Apple. 
we brought in eight points for the option. We lowered our out-of-pocket cost from 147. And again, I think I could do that math, but why you know, take a chance? 139. Now, what I like about that is if I didn't want to memorize things, I can just shop my answer set. You know, though in here, let's say they ask me, they tell me uh, this is a choice to me. You know, and if you are doing what I'm suggesting, you can just plug that in there. And if that makes a balance, you say, oh yeah, that works. That's the break even. So that's another way to proceed if you don't want to memorize a bunch of break evens. Okay, so max gain. We don't participate past the strike. So a couple ways to think of the uh, max gain. One way to think of the max gain is we don't participate past the strike. So we're net out of pocket, 139. And we have to sell the stock at the strike price. And the strike price here is 155. So that's one way we can proceed. And again, I warn you, if you're going to go down the memory road, you got a lot of things to memorize. Or, you know, I could say, Jacqueline, we make 147 to 155. That's eight points. Plus, we make the eight points from the contract. So the most we can make is 16 points. The most we can make is when we sell the stock at the strike price. Remember, we have an obligation to deliver the stock at 155. And again, another way you could proceed is by just plugging that in and then you can net the columns. So you can either memorize it's break even to strike, or I can say, okay, well, when I net these two numbers, right, I'm out for the stock 147. And I brought in uh, 163. And again, that would be another way to proceed. You can do that if you'd like. And again, I'm just going to check my math because I told you Dean is terrible at math. So 155 plus eight, yep, 163. And then that would be my max gain. So let's put that in here. Max gain is 16 points. Now, remember, I like to do things per share, but you got to be careful. It won't be both on the test, but this is 16 points. And then now I do my multiplication at the end. So I have one contract. Each of those contracts govern 100 shares. And so my max gain here is $1,600. So again, just be careful if you're doing it per share to multiply. If it was three contracts, I multiply it by three. Uh, by the way, I think that's easier than multiplying all the way through. So what I mean by that is, I think that's easier than having 14, seven, 15, five, 800, 14, seven, 16, three. I just think it's a, a bigger mess. Okay, so that's a covered call. That's a covered call. And the other thing we could have done, so let's just get rid of this. We said the other thing you can do is you could buy a put for protection. Uh, the covered call is more likely on your exam than is a uh, the long put. But uh, right now the floor is zero. The floor is zero. Wow. So you know I could lose 147 points. So I decided I'm going to buy some insurance, and I'm going to buy some protection. Protection costs money. I need one contract. Uh, I got to decide how long I want the protection in place. The longer I want the protection in place, the more it's going to cost me. Longer term option contracts always have greater premiums. So I'm going to buy one Apple a December. Now I got to decide where do I want to put in the floor? I'm doing construction. Construction costs money. A choice to sell at a higher price will give me greater protection. It'll also cost me more money. So a 145 put is going to cost me more than a 140. Higher strike put contracts always have greater premiums. So I'm going to buy the 140 put. And let's say this protection costs me four points. And again, you can do it any way you want, but again, particularly on puts, I'm a big believer that what you might want to do is underneath the contract, just remind yourself what you're looking at. What I mean by that is what we're looking at here is a choice to sell the stock at the strike price. Now you gotta be careful when you have stock. Remember, it's still bullish here. A lot of people go, I buy a put, I'm a bear. No, remember the stock position leads. So this is still bullish. If you weren't bullish, you wouldn't own the stock. So that's the first thing you gotta recognize. This is the one time and the one time only that we're gonna be adding to get the break even. Because again, the key thing is this is not 
a long put. You know, if you're just looking at that, you're going to say it's 136, I'm a bear, it's break even to zero. No, 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 no. That's not what this is. So is that uh, four points? Is that money out or money in? That four points. Chat is open. Is the four points money out or money in? Is the four points money out or money in? That's money out. And so I'm out 147 for the stock. I'm out four points for the protection. And so I'm out a total of 151. I'm out a total of 151. So the break even in a long put is stock cost plus premium. It's the one time and the one time only that we're adding when we have a put because it's not a put contract, it's a stock position. Stock dominates. So the break even here in this example, we paid 147 for the stock and we paid four points for the protection. So we're out of pocket, 151. That is our break even. All right, so uh, again, if you don't wanna memorize things, uh, I like the T because then you can just shop your answer set and you know that you need a number that if you plug it in there would make the columns balance, right? So if they offer me 151 as a break even, I plug that in, I say, indeed, the break even is the same dollars out as dollars in. Now, the reason you do this suitability test question, the reason you do this is to protect against a big price decline. Right, because now if uh, Apple uh, blows up in Apple at expiration, third Friday in December, Apple is 120. Am I going to sell my Apple at 120? Or am I going to stick it to somebody at 140? At expiration, Apple's 120, and I have a choice to sell at 140. Chat is open. Am I going to exercise my 140 put when Apple's at 120? Yes or no? Is Dean exercising the 140 put when the Apple's at 120? No, I'm going to exercise. I'm going to make somebody, I'm going to stick it to somebody at 140. Right? So that's my maximum loss. My maximum loss is the break even to the strike. I have protected now XP means strike price. Right? My out of pocket, 151. Anytime I want, I can sell the stock at 140. So my maximum loss here is 11 points. So my max loss, let's put that in here, is break even to the strike price, which in this case is a break even 151 to 140, that's when my protection kicks up. So my, it's gonna be 11 points. Now, again, you gotta be careful here. That's 11 points, remember, but that's for a contract. It's probably 100 shares, so it's $1,100. You know, the foundation of Mark Cuban's fortune is uh, selling broadcast.com to Yahoo for a billion dollars in Yahoo stock. And he was being asked, about and during the dot-com implosion, why he, like other billionaires, didn't lose tons of money. And they said, uh, what did, how come you didn't lose a bunch of money? He said, well, I was hedged. I was hedged. I had puts. I own puts on my Yahoo stock, and I had the choice to sell at 85. And so at expiration, Yahoo was 20, and I exercised my puts at 85. So you know, I didn't participate in that big price decline that everybody gathered in the dot-com implosion participated because I was hedged. Now, by the way, that's this is a hedge. We call this one an effective hedge because it kind of works. And the covered call is called a uh, partial hedge, kind of works. You know, on the covered call, we're bringing in some money. All right, so let's see. Uh, a leap and a strip. Well, let's just go to the top. I think our next one was <laughs> Madeline, the taxation and all products. <laughs> 
Um, you know, we obviously in an overtime Zoom session don't have enough time to do that. I would do it in the products, but basically, you know, when you make an investment, so if I buy whatever I'm buying, let's just say I'm buying a thousand shares of Apple at uh, 147. You know, the cost basis is when I turn the money into the investment. So if I buy Apple at 147, my cost basis is 147 per share or in total, $147,000. And then Madeline, I'm gonna sue several days, you know, later on, you know, I'm gonna turn that back into money, right? So my cost base is 147 per share or $147,000. And then later on, I'm gonna have what are called sales proceeds. And so that means now I'm just simply what that means, I'm turning the investment back into money and I'm hoping that I got more money in than out. So let's say I sell my thousand shares at uh, 167. So my sales proceeds is going to be 160, $160,000, 167 per share. And so I have a $20,000 capital gain. I owe capital gains on $20 per share are in total $20,000. Now, the next thing is how long did I have the Apple stock? Right, because this is either going to be taxed at my ordinary income tax rate, or it's going to be taxed as a long-term capital gain, depending on how long I've owned it. So how long do I have to be at risk in this Apple stock to qualify for a long-term capital gain? Now, listen, guys, if you don't participate in chat, I'm going to stop doing overtime Zoom sessions because... I don't feel like spending 45 minutes doing tricks on a whiteboard with no interaction from you guys. So you need to get in gear and start participating in chat or we will not be having any more overtime Zoom sessions. You can participate in chat or you can participate on muting, but you need to participate. Um, there you go. Thank you, Beth. More than a year. So if I'm at risk for more than a year, so now I give you a, a date. They're not, I, they're not gonna make you, you know, have to do like a calendar, but let's say I did this uh, today. Today is February 28th, uh, 2023. And let's say I do this on March 15th of 2024. So I owe a, a long-term capital gain tax on that $20,000. Uh, the capital gains tax is a transaction-based tax, and the easiest way not to pay it is not to transact. So if I don't turn the Apple back into money, I don't have to pay the tax, right? Now, let's say if this said, uh, I did this in uh, June of 2023, then that's going to be a short-term capital gain. And I'm going to vote taxes based on whatever my ordinary income tax rate is. And then what I'm going to do on my tax return taxes are coming up. I'm going to net all my gains and losses, all my gains and losses. And let's say I have a loss. So how much of a loss from my portfolio? So, you know, we're talking about my portfolio. This is my investments. You know, my portfolio or unearned income. And this is my paycheck. And how much can I uh, take from my portfolio losses to reduce my paycheck income on my tax return? What is the max I can take from here over to there? $3,000, very testable, $3,000, right? So if I made 95 grand, I can say I made 92 grand. Okay, and then the other thing is uh, interest income. And the only thing, uh, there's more than that. I have a video, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll link, uh, whoever asked this, who was the taxes, Madeline? I'll link in the replay of this uh, overtime session to my taxation lecture, where I go through all the tax consequences of uh, the investment on series seven. That's about 45 minutes. And I talk about partnerships. 
But the other big one I would say as we uh, get closer to the end here is that uh, make sure you understand that the muni bonds, only the tax-free coupon, the coupon nominal yield is tax-free. If I buy a muni bond low and sell it high, just like buying Apple stock, I owe taxes on that. The capital gains are gonna be taxable on a muni bond. So that would, I would definitely know. Um, I would know there's no taxes. If I receive no tax consequence to receiving a stock dividend or stock split, I just have to adjust my cost base. Don't overdose on taxes. If you tell me you missed the, the mark because of taxes, I'm gonna say, well, most of the time we're supposed to tell people get an accountant, I'm not a tax person. But I'm supposed to have a general understanding of how investments impact somebody's tax return, right? So let's see. So taxation on all products. We did a couple there. Di 90 Cynthia is sub chapter M. And what it says is a mutual fund is long. The IRS have been kind enough to say that as long as a mutual fund passes through 90% of the dividends on the stock in the portfolio, plus the interest on the bonds in the portfolio, less the expenses of the portfolio, the IRS have been kind enough to say that they'll wait and get the money from the individual mutual fund shareholders. And so that's called DI 90. And most mutual funds do much, much better than that because whatever they keep, they're gonna to have to pay taxes on. If we didn't have DI 90 or the subchapter M conduit or pipeline theory, what would happen is uh, Exxon would make money, pay taxes, pay a dividend to my mutual fund, they'd pay taxes and pay me a dividend if I pay taxes. My God, that money would be taxed three times. It'd be triple taxed. But with this, what happens is Exxon makes money, pays taxes, pays my mutual fund, my mutual and passes it through to me and I pay taxes. And that way it's only double taxed instead of triple taxed. Uh, what is another investment product test question that works like this? What's another one besides mutual fund that passes through at least 90% of its net investment income. Chat is open, what's another one? Yeah, REITs, very testable. And then a zero coupon bond, an OID originally issued a discount bond. The IRS says there's imputed interest I'm receiving. And on the test, I'm not gonna make you do this math, but you know, uh, if I'm buying a zero coupon bond, I'll just make up some numbers here. And uh, let's say that at maturity, I'm getting par. And let's say I paid uh, originally, I bought it as a primary transaction for 500. And let's say that it has uh, 10 years to maturity. So uh, here I have an imputed interest I'm receiving of $50. I'm not gonna make you do this math. That is the imputed interest I'm actually receiving on this bond per year. You know, what I would like to tell the IRS is that that's a $500 uh, long-term gain because I held it for more than a, uh, a year and they say no. So what I have to do here is uh, accretion. And here the accreted amount is gonna be $50 and I actually owe taxes on. And that kind of sucks as I'm paying taxes on money I'm not actually receiving, right? So I'm gonna pay $50 in interest tax on $50 here I didn't receive. And that kind of sucks. That's called fathom income when you're paying taxes on money you're not actually receiving, right? Okay, so let's see what else we got in here. Uh, it certainly does, Madeline, it certainly does. So. That it has that. It also has, we do this the other way on a muni and it's called decretion. So when we buy a muni bond at a premium, we have to do decretion, go in the other direction. And that you might actually have to do practical application on. Uh, LEAP, Jacob, a LEAP, you don't need a stands for long-term equity appreciation potential security. But the test question about a LEAP is that technically it goes out 39 months in practice 30 months. Oh my goodness, right? So. If I buy a, a LEAP, I would have a choice to buy Apple for the next two and a half years. Uh, P.S. That would be the only option contract where I could possibly qualify for a long-term capital gain because it's the only option contract where I could be a risk for more than a year. Uh, I would expect, Jacob, a question about a LEAP. Uh, I just gave you the, yeah, Jacob, the strip. The strip is the same. Strip, uh, uh, treasury receipts, zeros, OID, those are all the same things intellectually on the test in terms of what we're tested on, 
They're all the same as it relates to the test. Now, if it's a muni, uh, muni zero, then that imputed interest would not be taxable. Okay, any last minute things here? Well, listen, I don't know if you're getting the evaluation that you get uh, off the you set more on my booking page. You usually do, but uh, you know, I don't get to evaluate you guys. And I got to tell you, if we don't get more active in these 45 minutes with people participating, uh, I'm going to stop doing them. I'm not going to be doing tricks on a whiteboard if people aren't interacting in chat and, you know, uh, doing other things and watching me do tricks on the dry race board. So, you know, uh, for what it's worth, uh, that's your warning that I wasn't very uh, impressed with the participation at the beginning of this uh, Zoom session. Anything else before we call it a uh, day? Uh, Beth, the replays are posted on the YouTube home uh, page. There's a home on the home page. There's a thing that says, join us for a live Zoom class. And it's a playlist of all the replays. It has replays of coaching calls. It has replays of tutoring sessions. And it has replays of these overtime sessions. So as soon as we hang up, this will process. And it will be up there shortly. OK, Anything thank else? you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody got anything else before we call it a night? Now, remember, there's no overtime session next Tuesday. Uh, my uh, family, I got some health issues in San Diego with the family I got to go check on. So I'm leaving as soon as we do, done with the live stream. But there is one the following Tuesday, and that is up, and you can book that if you'd like. And then uh, I think it was, who was it, Jacqueline and Erica? Make sure you have the Zoom invite, because again, I'm going to get tighter on this stuff, because we have a million five hundred thousand views and 14,000 subscribers. And I got to make sure that I'm not you know, sending Zoom links, you know, to half a dozen people. So if you don't have the Zoom link, please make sure you check. And if you don't have it, you know, send me the email like, you know, that morning so I can manually put you in and send you that automated email with the link rather than me doing it manually. Anything else? Thank you. I appreciate it, Beth. You know, my dad yeah. is kind of a, a, you know, I, the problem with my dad is when he tells me he's not doing well, it's, it's hard to tell, you know, I have to go physically see myself, you know, what the state of affairs is, so. Anything else? Yeah. yeah, Dean, I had a question about yeah, the public call. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, 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 you, if you write a covered call and then you write it out of the money. Whoa, 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 whoa. You don't buy a covered 